So with that, uh, let me introduce our speaker. Uh, he goes by Doge. He's a staff, science, a staff research scientist at Google Brain. Uh, and the title of this talk today is Scaling Up Materials Discovery Via Deep Learning. Um, so Doge, please take it away. Let me stop sharing my screen and the floor is yours. And can you see my slides right now? Okay, let's go. I can hear you, the slides not yet. Perfect, we're almost there. All right, we see the slides. Oh, but now you're muted, I think. So we cannot hear you at the moment. Okay, you're good. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Anwar, for the introduction. It's really nice to be talking to you all. Um, you'll notice in our talk that we've extensively used the Data in Materials project and PyMed Gen. So it's really nice to be sharing it with the community. Um, and we're lucky to have Matt Horton and Matt McDermott here with us. Uh, very nice to see them. And uh, before I start the talk, let me quickly introduce you to the team. The um, two students that have done really amazing work here are Amil Merchant. And you're lucky that Amil actually made the trek from Stanford to here. So he'll be presenting some of his own work. You'll see that he actually did most of the work we'll be presenting today. And another student uh, who's at Harvard right now, so he can't be here, Simon Batzner, has also done amazing work here. Uh, you'll see he's done a lot of the equivariant GNNs and the ML molecular dynamic simulations. And then Sam and Gawun are long-term collaborators who uh, contributed really nice things here that we'll hopefully be able to highlight. And um, great, so I want to introduce Amil. He's a, he was a resident at Google. That's how we started working together, but he's now a PhD student at Stanford and also is a student researcher at Google. It's kind of like an internship uh, project. And I'd like him to start by pr uh, introducing some of our work. Hi, nice to meet everyone. Can you see me all right? All right, perfect. Um, so a little bit about the talk for today. Uh, I think we're gonna go through these six main points. Uh, I'll be covering the first three on like why use machine learning, pipeline details, and the summary of the R discovered crystals. And those will probably take over for four to six. Um, so I guess this is the kind of crowd where we don't really need this section on the importance of material properties. So uh, I guess what we really just want to highlight are like different approaches to materials discovery um, and kind of highlight the history here. So uh, a lot of early work was experimental um, with the great work done by the Inorganic Crystal Structure Database, or ICSD, uh, which now contains up to 20,000 computationally stable structures. Um, and when we were thinking about how to scale approaches to materials discovery, experimental approaches seem difficult or infeasible to scale, uh, mostly due to like costs and complications in synthesis. Um, so a different approach, especially uh, that has been popular in the past decade and has been championed by Materials Project, OQMD, AFLOW, and all these other great groups um, is like computational cataloging via uh, DFT computations. And here there have been 35,000 uh, approximately computationally stable structures. Um, and either using various data-driven methods or substitutions, um, there's been about a 1% discovery rate uh, for the, the discovery of new materials or new crystal structures. And so I guess a lot of what uh, this cataloging approach gives you is that if you get a lot of materials, you can start to filter down into desired uh, for desired properties. So for example, you can look for sufficient stability that with, leads to a fairly large set, um, but then like filtering by addition or additional properties such as high chemical stability, low electronic conductivity, high ionic, high ionic, uh, high ionic conductivity, and then low cost gets you fewer and fewer examples. So a lot of the approaches to materials discovery here is just to make the sets of known materials larger and larger so that when this filtration is applied, hopefully more than just a few examples pop out at the end and hopefully some of them end up being useful for real world applications. Um, so I guess a lot of the goals of our team, um, and I guess materials discovery in general, are to enlarge the set of known stable materials, uh, discover crystals with desirable electrochemical properties, and uh, especially what we've been interested in is in unlocking modeling capabilities uh, via deep learning. Um, so kind of moving on to that point, onto that last point is like why use machine learning in the first place? 
Um, I think we can all agree that like DFT is fairly expensive. Um, and ML models on the other hand are like very cheap and highly parallelizable. Um, and so three main points I wanna highlight here are that ML models showcase very favorable uh, scaling properties. So with increasing number of atoms, uh, the like simulations don't get like cubically slower, um, but like can be scaled really easily. Um, they improve with usage in the sense that like uh, running a single DFT computation might get you one result, but uh, using machine learning, the more you use the kind of model and the more you like produce data, the better and better these ML models can get. And so these data kind of like flywheels where the data you produce actually feeds in to improve the model over time um, is like something that we're particularly excited about with the use of machine learning. And then the last point is that uh, machine learning models are cheap and highly parallelizable, but they also don't have to be the end of the story. They can be used to guide more expensive computations. So a lot of the story that we'll be talking about today is how we can use ML models as a starting point for DFT calculations. So it's not like we are going to use the output of the ML models as the like end all be all prediction, um, but we can confirm computations with DFT in a much more cheap setting than running full DFT relaxations or trajectories um, and just use ML as a framework to guide all of this exploration. Um, so I guess where we're starting out is that papers are in the past couple years have hit like one to three percent uh, hit rates on stable structures with a limited number of uh, proposals. A lot of these have been like from data-driven structural substitutions, uh, modifying the no known structural or known structures that are stable and various different approaches. Um, and I guess what I kind of want to highlight is that machine learning will hopefully let us improve beyond these percentages and get significantly more efficient or hit, uh, higher hit rate pipelines for the discovery of stable structures. And so uh, we really enjoyed reading this paper uh, from Chris Bartel in 2020 about the problems of using uh, machine learning for materials discovery. And this paper really inspired us. So uh, we wanted to highlight some of the insights that we got from this paper or from reading this paper, um, as well as like how it shaped our view of using machine learning for uh, materials discovery. And so in 2020, uh, in 2020 uh, recent form, uh, models, machine learning models trained on formation energies of materials project um, had a mean absolute error of 28 uh, mill electron volts per atom. Um, and although like these were thought to be like fairly good formation energy predictions, uh, the Bartel paper actually showed that the decomposition energies uh, are actually often inaccurate. And so uh, the, two uh, the two diagrams below show that for like two popular formation energy models um, that have these like low MAEs, the uh, decomposition energy predictions are very significantly off. And so this is just like one insight into why like in 2020, it would be difficult to apply machine learning to this problem of materials discovery. Um, as I was kind of, <laughs> I kind of already said this point, um, but I guess this is like an example of like trying to find uh, new materials. And it was just a particularly difficult example uh, to do uh, in 2020, where there were a lot of false negatives and false positives, but actually getting like true positives was particularly difficult with uh, the kinds of models that were being used. Um, and so I guess one of the insights that we really enjoyed and like have talked a lot about internally at least um, is the limited generalization beyond data used in training. So while the like models uh, that are trained on materials project are very good at generalizing to like held out test sets that are like randomly assigned. Um, the common problem in using machine learning for these kinds of prediction problems is that when you wanna do something novel, like search for new stable materials, you're actively trying to move away from the space of known materials or your data set space in general. And so it's unclear how your machine learning models are gonna generalize in this space. So in the example of figure on the right, uh, say we have the two moons data set, uh, which are the blue and orange. And you want to know what the prediction is at the red data points. Like most machine learning models will struggle in this regime just because it is far away from your data examples. And this kind of like generalization 
uh, kind of performance doesn't happen for free. It happened, there's been like some insights that it happens in large data settings that Joe's will talk about later in the talk. Um, but the idea is that it doesn't come for free on small data sets. And so a lot of what we were interested in is understanding how scale um, influences generalization, how we can improve performance over time. And third, like how can we just discover more materials with better machine learning models? Um, so kind of the main highlight of that paper that we have, um, or that we understood, was that novel discovery implicitly requires going beyond the space of known materials and actually creating machine learning models that not only generalize, but also like have accurate predictions that can guide discovery. Um, so I'm gonna highlight a little bit of our like data pipeline details. Um, this will like jump a couple of steps and these are like more complete data pipelines that we've created uh, over the past few years, I guess, at this point. Um, but the idea is uh, I try and describe like each step in detail and try and motivate how we design them. Um, so I guess these discovery pipelines come in two forms. There's the structural pipeline, which is using more of the structural substitution-like methods um, in order to uh, guide compute or DFT computation. And then there's the more like elemental pipeline where say you only have the composition or the reduced formula and you actually predict that it might be stable. How do you go about finding a structure in that space um, that might be suitable or might be computationally stable. Um, so I'll try and highlight each step on both of these sides. Uh, so in the structural pipeline, uh, these data, the data actually starts with materials project, OQMD, or any other computations that we have run internally. And uh, initial graph network models can be trained on these, like on this materials project data, OQMD data, or, or our own. And in the elemental pipeline, we use a reduced version of oxidation state balancing that uh, is not like all that important, but basically just enlarges the space rather than doing like exactly charge balanced compositions. Um, then the core idea here is that uh, the core idea in using machine learning for materials discovery is that we actually want to generate like very, very diverse candidates and not just go from like not just go to like neighboring structures uh, for discovery. So this is like moving farther and farther away from the data distribution in order to produce diverse candidates. And these can be used uh, to then, or these then can then be evaluated via machine learning uh, rather than having to have some intuition that just because it is close to something that is stable, uh, it will already be. We, we get this intuition from the graph networks. So in the structural pipeline, uh, this diverse candidate generation comes from uh, various forms of ionic and elemental substitution. There's some new methods on like symmetry aware of partial substitutions, alternate prototype methods that like we won't go into too much detail today. Um, but the whole idea here is to enlarge the space as much as possible. So the SAPS kind of uh, layer in this pyramid is just to enlarge the set of uh, known examples or known candidates or candidates for discovery as large as possible. And this is kind of similar to what the oxidation state reduced balancing serves in uh, the elemental pipeline. And then the next stage in both, uh, both forms of the pipeline are these graph networks that we've been training. Um, so in the structural pipeline, uh, the diverse candidates come with a structure. So we just train structural graph networks and structural graph network ensembles to predict energies and associated stability. And then in the elemental pipeline, it's very similar to the compositional graph networks where we don't actually get edge connections that we know of, but rather can interact with the known ratios of the compositions in order to predict structures and or in order to predict energies. And then the last step in the elemental pipeline is random structure search, where once we have an idea that a composition family is energetically favorable, uh, we'll apply known methods such as ARRSS or other ones that we've been working on um, to actually produce a structure. And once we have structures, uh, both of these can be run via density function theory. Um, so DFT simulations on VOSP with like fairly standard uh, settings from Materials Project. We try to our best to match the settings that Materials Project uses and have consistent energies. Um, and then, so this is like the main 
kind of discovery pipelines that we've been using. And I guess what I want to highlight here is it's not just one pass of this triangle. We don't just go like one, two, three, four at once. Uh, one of the like big highlights here is that we can do this over and over again. So as kind of the data flywheel that I was discussing, every time we do DFT calculations, we can go back, add this to our example data set. We can add this data to our training, uh, training data for our GN models, and we can repeat this loop over and over again, improving over time. And this is true on both sides of the elemental and structural pipelines. Um, so this is what I've kind of just been discussing where we have this like active learning procedure where these models like improve over time. Um, so initial models kind of in July 2021, um, this is like great work that like Sam pushed on, uh, was just create like state of the art graph networks uh, that were getting MAEs of 20 mil electron volts per atom um, on materials project data. Uh, so this is like slightly improved off the 28 number that we were reading at the time, um, but we were still only getting about six to 13% hit rates. So by hit right here, I mean like number of DFT calculations to number of stable structures compared to the materials project um, on small proposal sets. Um, and so the idea here is like before we had any additional data, uh, hit rates were not bad, but uh, we're still relatively low. Um, so we iterated on this idea of discovery. Uh, iterative discovery is tied to new data creation and it allows for this uh, more and more diverse generation over time in the sense that like the six to 13% I was uh, telling you about a couple slides ago might've been on like a set like one X, but as we've gone larger and larger, our models have improved and we get better out of distribution generalization, we can increase this diverse generation like 10 X, 50 X, even larger and get better performance over time. And our models are able to actually cope with this kind of larger and more diverse can generation. And so I guess before presenting the numbers directly, I just want to highlight that like hit rate is like very clearly not an exact metric because it depends on like the thresholds used for candidate generation. It depends on like how many examples were uh, put in to like the set used to generate candidates. Um, and there's a lot of other like hyperparameters in this like kind of space. So we don't want like it to be thought of as like an exact number um, but the idea here is that uh, for structural substitutions, we can get over 80% hit rate at like very reasonable thresholds where like 80% of our DFT runs will be computationally stable compared to the materials project, uh, if that's so desired. And then for the compositional or uh, what I also referred to as elemental models on previous slides, uh, these can be as high as 33%. Um, and a lot of, some of that complication is like in the generation of good structures once we have a good compositional candidate and there's a little bit more to describe here. Um, but I also wanna say that like these single numbers may not be the full story because we also have like a high parameter which is like the pipeline threshold. And we can tune this uh, if we wanna encourage discovery more, we can increase or loosen the threshold a little bit for slightly lower hit rates, we can get more structures. And the same if we wanted to push it past 90%, we could have very tight thresholds for these structural substitutions. But either way, uh, we think that this 80% is a relatively fair uh, comparison, but happy to answer questions about it uh, some other time. Um, and so I guess uh, before I hand it over to Doge, I wanted to talk a little bit about our summary of discovered crystals. Um, our stable, uh, our convex hull now consists of approximately 400,000 total stable materials um, with like 1.8 a uh, million stable with respect to materials project. And I guess uh, before talking about this in too much detail, I wanted to highlight that like this footnote that uh, it's both the energies computed from a download of materials project and also a recreation internally um, that we reproduce the energies via DFT with our like standard settings and then took the lower of the two energies and so stable with respect to the lower of the two energies for all materials project structures that we computed. Um, so that's, we just wanted to make sure that the comparison was like like to like. Um, so that is uh, how we were doing this number or how we achieve this number. Um, so I'm gonna give like a quick rundown of some of the results and like some of the 
uh, like general purpose overviews of this like 400,000 number that I discussed like previously. Um, this is like the elemental distribution or mostly like how many unique elements are in each of our stable crystals. And so it seemingly clear that like the binaries is lower than everything else. Ours is the purple and then uh, materials project is in the light blue underneath. And so the idea here is that binaries has been both well explored, um, but also like there are fewer possible compositions in that space. So not only is the like limit lower, but we, we think that region is fairly well explored and our numbers support that. Uh, ternaries, uh, fairly significant growth. Quaternaries, also fairly significant growth. And then uh, we've been excited and I'll discuss this slightly better or slightly later about like quaternaries or in like searching in spaces that are really hard for manual uh, exploration. Like quaternaries are like the more and more like degrees of freedom you have um, into like the space of quaternaries, centuries and even higher numbers. Um, manual approaches become very, very difficult. But these uh, machine learning models have shown impressive generalization capabilities that we'll discuss in a couple slides. Um, just very quickly, uh, overview of the formation energies. There's uh, some recent work suggests, or some work uh, over the past couple of decades that have been suggesting that like the higher number of elements that you have, the more the like formation energies of stable materials shift to the left. Um, we see this in our data. Uh, it's like not a very, very obvious trend, but uh, I think mostly just to show that like the formation energies are fairly reasonable. They're not like DFT errors or uh, infrastructure problems, um, but we're generally in the right space. Um, I guess some of the uh, really interesting things are like, where are we discovering these new materials and how do they relate to the materials already discovered? Um, and so I guess what we want to highlight here is like the space of stable materials isn't just like slightly finding points on the convex hull or like finding points like very close, but rather like uh, we can compute the decomposition energy uh, relative to materials project, which is both like the download and the recreation, as well as the OQMD, uh, our, our own version of an OQMD re, uh, re, recreation, sorry. Um, and we get decomposition energies that are fairly reasonable. Um, so where MP and OKMD would be at zero, this is like our data distribution of decomposition energies. Um, another way to visualize this is via the relative decomposition energy. So what I'll slightly describe here is that the relative decomposition energy is basically the uh, distance to the convex hull if you just remove a single stable material. And so you can think about this as like reproducing the convex hull and just the relative distance of that one material. Um, so we start with MP, um, relatively or relatively good. We add on OQMD, so maybe it's slightly mislabeled, but it's like the joint is the blue. And then our data distribution is like the light gray. And the idea here is like this is on quaternaries, but it's mostly to show that like we aren't just populating this like convex hull and getting more and more detail on the granular uh, for like granularity on the convex hull. But there do appear to be like relatively interesting materials um, that are fairly stable, uh, especially uh, that we have discovered. Um, and we hope to explore them further. Uh, this is the trend for the quaternaries that were discovered. And it's like uh, one of the more obvious ones, the binary ones like slightly different because there were fewer discovered. The ternaries and uh, quinturies are fairly similar with like minor defects, um, but this is the, just to highlight, this is on quaternary structures. Um, and then finally, I think one of the last couple of things that I'll be talking about today is uh, about prototypes. Um, so a lot of our discovery has not been trying to just like uh, fully compute the space of substitutions, uh, like that is possible, but there's like a really clear, interesting component in trying to like discover new symmetry groupings, new basis sets, and in particular, just discovering new prototypes because we believe that they yield multiplicative increases in stable compositions. And this is kind of through the idea of the active learning that we discussed before, because as soon as we get a new stable prototype or a new like prototype that is like of reasonable energy, we're able to like push this through our data pipelines and like repetitively get more and more stable structures into that 
into these new prot prototype regimes. So these are a couple data points for binary ternary and quaternary prototypes. Um, this was measured using a flow lib X style finder um, that we thought was like a particularly good uh, way to discover uh, or just like get an exact number of prototypes without like directly being involved. So we thought it was great to like have an already pre-built kind of prototype matcher and uh, provide the numbers on our uh, new sets. And then I guess the last thing I'm going to highlight is like pushing the limits of like what machine learning can do. And this will kind of like tie into like where Doge is starting um, in the sense that like machine learning models are particularly good at like taking this increasing and in, increasingly large data that we have and like generalizing beyond what we could, what we originally thought the limits of the models would be. So I'll just say like after a couple rounds of this active learning, um, we were just wondering like how uh, we were only working on up to the quaternaries. We were working on four unique elements or lower. And at some point we were just like, these models are pretty good. Like, let's see how far they can go. And so we were already getting like 80% hit rate on stuff that was directly or like around the same as like the training data. Um, and then we just tested on quinteries, which are like five element structures never seen in training. And it was already doing greater than 50% hit rates uh, without explicitly ever seeing a five element model. And so we thought this was like fantastic. It like not only let us like start producing quinteries at like a re or close to stable or stable quinteries at a really, really fast rate, but it also like means that like we can take this 50% hit rate, learn really quickly what a stable quintery is. And then we've been pushing this hit rate back to like the 80% uh, as to like once we get training data in it. Uh, once we get training data with quinturies, we can push it higher and higher. Um, so we've been pushing this 50% higher, but like it's so great that like these ML models learn over time and it was just 50% without very significant work, just a trying a new regime. So I think uh, this will pu uh, put us a little bit into the mind frame that Doge is gonna talk all about um, in the next couple slides. But the idea of scaling, generalization, where machine learning plays in, um, so I'm going to hand it over to Dush. Thanks, Samuel. That was a really nice introduction. I'm worried that the talk will go downhill from here. But uh, so I'll start by um, talking about some of the applications. And the reason for this is, you know, when I was doing my postdoc at Stanford and Evan Reed's group, uh, one of the really nice ways uh, we benefited from materials project was screening through the thing, the materials and materials project for different applications. So one of these applications was solid electrolytes. Uh, we were interested in finding novel ones. And what we did was just went through materials project, found the stable materials, and then we screened for um, high ionic conductivity, low electronic conductivity, as um, Amil mentioned earlier. And this work was led by Austin Sandek uh, in Evan Reese group. And what we had found at the time was there were about 21 promising solid electrolyte candidates, given our five different uh, filtration um, mechanisms. And you know, out of those 20 ones, we talked to our experimental colleagues. They liked only a few that they wanted to make. A few of them were made and verified, but it just kind of showed us like how we could benefit if there were more stable materials. Um, so for this reason, as soon as we got these new stable materials, we want to see how many of them could make good solid uh, electrolyte candidates. And even though we didn't really guide our discovery towards lithium containing materials or battery related materials, we found about 60 of them already. <clears throat> I think we actually have more now. And we also have sodium ion conductors, hydrogen conductors, so since our search was pretty agnostic, I think our applications are also going to be agnostic. So this was uh, encouraging to see. Another material that was uh, quite of interest at the time were layered materials. And um, for this one, graduate student at the time in Evan Rees group, Gawun Cheon, who is also a co-author of this work, had um, gone through materials project and found layered materials that could be layered or layered materials that could have a you know standalone monolayer. And she had found about 1,000 candidates. And again, we find that using the exact same filtration, we can find 32,000 in our data. So hopefully this suggests that if you all are interested in uh, some other materials technology application, 
you can use our data, find promising ones, and hopefully we can iterate towards these being useful to experimentalists. Okay, so, so far we talked about material discovery and applications. The, for the remaining of the talk, I'd like to uh, switch gears a bit towards a more deep learning-esque uh, direction and talk about what we can do with the data we collected for applications that we did not even think about while we were generating the data. So I'm calling it zero shot here. It's a term from deep learning. Um, I'm not sure if our use is very precise, but basically what I'm saying is we have a data set, we're going to train on it, but then we're gonna use our graph neural networks for completely auto domain tasks, auto domain data, and see how well we do. And why would we care about this? So I guess one reason is we want to see if the models we're training are overfitting to our task and data, or are they learning something that's generalizable from quantum mechanics? And the other reason is, you know, we'd like to keep working on materials uh, science, and we don't want to generate a large data set and do millions of DFT calculations for every application. It would be really nice if we could see that the calculations we've done so far allow us to do new things that we didn't even, you know, think about. And for that, I'll first talk about um, predicting the energy of a randomly relaxed crystal. So you are probably familiar with the AI RSS model that Amil mentioned earlier. The basic idea is what you know, deep learning folk would call random search. You randomly place atoms and then you relax them. And you can imagine that if you do this, the kind of crystals you get that are relaxed are very different than the kind of crystals that are in materials project and the kind of crystals we've been getting from taking materials project and OQMD and substituting elements. And you can kind of see that my prediction or your prediction will be correct by looking at the rightmost blue point. Uh, maybe I can turn on the laser here. So I'm talking about this point basically. So this is kind of about 100,000 training samples in our uh, materials project from our materials project data. If you train on that, as Amil mentioned earlier, you can get down to about 20 MeV per atom energy prediction, which sounds great. But then if you evaluate that on this new data set, which is randomly relaxed crystals, the error is about 100. And you might recognize this number. This is what uh, Chris Bartel and Gerd have been saying is about the decomposition energy prediction limit. Like at this predictive ability, you're basically not going to be able to predict if a material is going to be stable or not. And this sounds really bad. It's auto domain. We're not generalizing well. And the predictions are here worthless in the sense that they'd be as bad as random search on um, you know, deciding whether a given material is stable or not. But one thing we noticed is that if you were to subset materials project and look at smaller and smaller sizes, you get this power law in the error as a function of the data set size. And you might already be familiar with these power laws from deep learning where initially Baidu research, but later OpenAI have found many examples where the more resource you put into deep learning, the better your accuracy gets and the error usually follows the power law. And this one is a bit different than those power laws you might have seen because those usually refer to in-domain errors. For example, you train on ImageNet and test on ImageNet. But here we're training on materials project and structural substitute, like elemental substitutions, but testing on something new, which is why the power law is shifted up than the in-domain power law, but it continues. And then this was um, encouraging. So as we add more and more data, we are able to bring it down to, I think here you're seeing 30, but I think we got down to 25 MeV per atom. And this is quite nice because I'm getting quite comfortable now calling this a universal static as in relaxed formation energy model, because like, even though the data comes from completely random uh, initializations, the crystals come out as crystals that we can make good predictions on. So now we're gonna shift gears a bit. So far, everything Amil and I talked about included energy predictions. We were just predicting formation energies. But here we realized, right, we can also predict forces. And the reason for this is when we were doing these relaxations, um, we were getting trajectories of relaxations which had forces and stress outputs. And then since we have all this data, we can train on them. And what we're gonna do here is train on forces that we get from relaxations, but test it on data from molecular dynamics. And we'll do several different things here. There are some really nice molecular dynamics data sets that are open source, even though that was done by not us and not our DFT settings, we are able to just predict the forces on them accurately, which is great. And we also ran our own MD. 
And here again, which is something that's very interesting to me is we're seeing a power law again here. So just to maybe uh, <laughs> repeat it to death here, we're taking a model trained on relaxations from substitutions and then we're applying it on <clears throat> doing molecular dynamics and predicting forces on a new material we haven't seen before. <clears throat> and we're seeing that our predictions get better and better as a power law. So this was um, very encouraging to us. And then we started doing crazier and crazier things. So here we take this um, data set that were created by the authors listed here. Um, they were benchmarking different force fields. And one of the benchmarks they had was a baylor Parnello network, the, the, you know, the network architecture that started it all back in 2008. And in this paper, they had trained it on 241 different frames. And they had gotten an error of 60 MeV per angstrom on the force for a lithium crystal. And we take our model that has been trained on zero frames of MD, and our model already predicts 40. This is again encouraging, suggests some kind of zero shot generalization. Here it's a little more difficult because um, oh, one thing we probably didn't mention is to make sure our predictions are not, um, we don't have test set leakage. What we do is we have a hash on composition and we make sure we never have the same composition on the training set and test it. So for example, I know the materials project have about more than 200 entries for silicon dioxide. And if we were to randomly split them, we might have the same silicon dioxide structure in both training and test, and there'll be a uh, label leakage. So we make sure that a composition is only in the training set, only in the test set. So all the phases from the composition is only on one of the sets. So here we are looking at nickel, which happens to be in our test set. So we've never seen pure nickel crystal in our training set, although we have seen the nickel element in different crystals. And our prediction error matches that of a baylor Parnell network that were actually trained directly on that data. And then here, this is again a bit harder. Now we're trying to try it on a defect that we've never seen before in our data, but our error is around 70 MeV per angstrom again. And you can kind of see the scatter plot between the predicted force and the true force. So this suggests that we could now take our models and do vacancy relaxations, even though uh, that was in our training set. And um, finally, I want to show you something that we're really excited about, uh, kind of like recent results that um, we tried using our ML force field that we only trained from relaxations to do MD, but now we do these long MD simulations and try to determine if a given solid electrolyte might be a good lithium ion conductor. And uh, we first start with this model in Blue Star. This is a really nice work led by Chi. And the paper actually just got published last week, but uh, you know, Chi being the amazing researcher, he has yet already open sourced the model and the data. Um, so what we did is we trained the NEQIP on his data and we did molecular dynamics on a bunch of crystals. And the goal was to see if we can match DFT prediction about whether a given electrolyte is a good lithium ion conductor. And our threshold was at um, 0 0.1 millisiemens per centimeter. And uh, so it's gonna be an you know, accuracy comparison. It'll range between 0% and 100%. And Chi's model already does pretty well. This, is, this would already be very useful. It gets about a 32% error. So you know, 78% um, of the time, cheese mo che a model trained on cheese data would already tell you if it's gonna be a good conductor or not. But since we have more and more data, we want to see how this prediction changes with uh, more relaxation data in the training set. And we almost see something like power law. I don't want to call this a power law because the y-axis has a very small range. It's not even half a decade, but it is suggestive that it gets monotonically better. And um, <clears throat> we were able to predict the outcome of an MD run with a model that was just trained on relaxations. And of course, we don't just stop here. This is just to showcase the zero shot ability, but since we also have some MD data, we can fine tune on the MD data. And of course, fine tuning is gonna be better than zero shot and we can significantly lower this below 10%. So this now means that you don't have to do as much DFT, but get DFT quality prediction about whether a crystal will be a good lithium ion conductor with you know 92% accuracy. Great, so let me quickly acknowledge all the people that um, contributed to this work. So on the left side, we have the external uh, folk who helped us. On the right side, we have the Google internal folk. And <clears throat> I want to, of course, emphasize materials project, because as you can see, we use a lot of the data and the PyMed gen code 
that really helped us do the analysis, the generation. So it's really nice to have them you know, available for us to use immediately. We similarly use some data from OQMD and ICSD. And then Matt, who's here, has been super helpful uh, over the last two years. I've sent him so many you know, anxious emails like, Matt, is this broken? Is this broken? Um, can you help me understand why this is not giving the right result? So we're super thankful to Matt for doing that. I also heard, um, so Simon was an intern with us last summer. And Simon told me a story where when he just started MIT as a master's student, he needed some charge density data. And apparently Matt bought a, a hard drive put all the charge densities on it and shift it all the way from Berkeley to Boston. So the kind of showcases um, how an amazing researcher and supporter researcher is. So thank you, Matt. And then we also benefited a lot from, as Amil mentioned, Chris Bartel's led work um, <clears throat> on benchmarking GNNs for material discovery and Chill's work on uh, Magnet and M3 GNET. Um, and you know these two researchers have put all the data and all the models that produce their uh, papers online, which has been really um, nice and it really made our lives easier. And then Austin helped us quite a bit with um, implementing his electrolyte uh, lithium ion conduction predictions properly. And um, I also would like to thank all the people at Google who helped us with this. Um, and finally, I can just quickly tell you what our next steps are. So we desperately need material scientists who'd like to collaborate. And there are two reasons for that. One is we'd like to further analyze our discoveries. As you can see, we already benchmarked them for ion conductivity, lithium and a few other ions, and for layered materials. But there are, of course, many other properties that we're not experts in and we haven't even thought about. And we are, going, we are in the process of open sourcing all of the data, but we also like to verify their correctness. Uh, it's such a large high throughput data, and as Matt says, Whenever you have high throughput results, there might be mistakes in them. Our data definitely has them. So it would be nice to work together and like find new materials and find mistakes. And of course, we desperately need experimental verification. All of this has been so far zero Kelvin uh, stability. And of course, there'll be issues with using that to predict experiments, but hopefully we can fine tune and figure out together. Now that we have a really detailed, large convex hole compared to before, hopefully our zero Kelvin predictions can be more uh, properly benchmarked. And then finally, we'd like to use our zero shot models and data to start predicting kinetic stability and synthesizability, which will of course be much harder, but much more useful. And hopefully our um, zero shot models that have been showing really promising results can be helpful there. So thanks all for listening. Uh, this has been great and uh, we look forward to your questions. Great, so thank you so much, uh, Doge and Emil, for the talk. We're now into the Q&A portion. Um, if you're able to look at the Q&A panel in Zoom itself, you can just kind of skim through the questions and it would be helpful if you can just read them out loud, pick a question, read it out loud and answer it. I do wanna point out that at the end, the, one of the, the last questions is how can we get in touch with you regarding potential collaborations? So that might be one to start with is uh, if people are interested in collaborating, how would they get in touch? And then uh, there are, of course, the other questions as well. Great. So our first slide has our mails and my emails. Um, I'll just leave that as the shared screen. Yeah. Great. And are you able to see the Q&A panel where uh, the different questions are? I don't know if one of those will catch your eye more than the others. If not, I can uh, read some of these questions out loud to you. So whichever you prefer. Oh, now I am. Sorry, I just had to click the right button. Um, okay, okay, let me see. So 25 questions. So let me quickly see. Um, ah, the first question is uh, easy to address. Uh, the first attendee said there are more than 200,000 entries in ICSD. Did you miss a zero? Uh, so we reported not the number of crystals at ICSD, but the number of computationally stable crystals, according to DFT. So we are not reporting all the crystals there, although we do, of course, use them for training. But we were just mentioning that about 20,000 of them uh, are on the convex hall of materials project. Um, if that's not clear, please let us know. Uh, another question that's also very easy to address is, uh, why is Google interested in material science? How does this kind of research help Google apart from publicity and testing their hardware software stack? Great question. So um, maybe we should have said this earlier, we're particularly from Google Brain, which uh, is very academic. It kind of generally, generally supports um, curiosity-based free research. 
and I just happen to have a PhD in uh, material science and machine learning, so I'm personally interested. But many of us here feel like um, material science could benefit from machine learning, and since we have quite a bit of expertise at Google Brain, it's a good fit. On the other hand, I think machine learning can benefit quite a bit from material science because, you know, so maybe I'll, I'll do I'll get a little philosophical here. I think. Computer scientists for a long time just described deep learning or machine learning as a IID fitting test where you're, where you're training set and tested at the same distribution. But I always had the feeling that that was not what we needed. Like the real intelligence is generalizing auto domain. But that's kind of a vague statement because given a training set, there are infinite number of distribution shifts. So then one has to know a useful distribution shift and then work with that. And I feel like material science gives us a very useful distribution shift, which is how do we discover new materials? And you can immediately see this, like if you take uh, Materials Project 2018 data, which was open sourced by Chi as part of his magnet paper, and then train on it, and then test on Materials Project 2019 data, which was also uh, date stamped by Chi, you see that your prediction gets worse. And it's a very realistic distribution shift. That's just basically, what the material scientists have found or added between 2018 and 2019. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really good benchmark for us. Already we're seeing these power laws that are very interesting. Um, so I think it's mutually beneficial. And I think Google Brain in general has been very interested in using deep learning to help society. And I, I can't like imagine a better use than to you know find new materials, hopefully contribute to mitigating climate change and just improve technology. Uh, thanks for the great question. Um, um, there's one question that maybe I'll um, have Matt answer, so I'm skipping. Oh, yeah, one question is, can you re-explain what you mean by hit rate? So what we mean is, if we predict that a material will be stable using machine learning, what is the probability that when we do DFT on it, its decomposition energy is zero or negative? Um, but of course, there are also a lot of interesting materials that are not negative or zero, but positive, like within zero and 50 MeV per atom. We don't include those in our statistics just to have like a well-defined number, but those are of course interesting and it will be good to look at them. What data set size do you recommend for ML? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I, I obviously don't know. It really depends on how good your features are. So like, you know, just like a very silly statement, if your feature was the label, you, you know, don't need any training. Um, in Austin's model that I talked about, he only had 40 samples. He used experimental data points, but his features were so good. They were physically motivated. There were only five of them that he made good predictions. So it really depends. And then there's all this work in more like abstract machine learning about double descent, about how like your model might actually get worse as you increase data or you know number of features before it gets better. I don't know how applicable it is to realistic models, but it's an active area of research and unfortunately there's no like general answer for that. Um, how to access the structure data. So we are in the process of writing the paper and uh, producing paths to sharing data. Um, so it's not available yet, but th th that's our goal. And um, hopefully we're, we're a pretty small team, uh, unlike some other teams that have been in industry doing chemistry and material science. We're really a few people. So we're doing our best. We're going to do it as fast as possible. But we also want to make sure we don't share unhelpful data. So we want to uh, kind of verify it step by step and share as we verify them. Uh, if possible, can you explain what zero shot prediction means? Yeah. So I think in my case, what I meant was we test our GNN on tasks that it's never been trained before. Um, I don't think that's exactly what zero shot means in deep learning, but also we're doing something different than what regular deep learning researchers do. So I'm comfortable with like slightly misusing the term. But you know, when we train just on relaxation data for material discovery, but then test it on molecular dynamics, that's what I would call zero shot because we never train on molecular dynamics data, but we're uh, trying to guess things about molecular dynamics. Um, 
I'm, I'm getting a little tired. Do you want to take over for a bit? Uh, here, do, do you also take, I mean, you can kind of like, you know, scroll up and down. Also, Matt, did you have any questions for us? Like, since you're here, it's also nice to have like real I, direct question. <laughs> no, no problem, Matt. Um, I, I'll, I'll defer to the people in the in the uh, in the room first. Okay. Well, can I answer maybe just one question? Yeah. So there was one question about whether. Um, neural networks can be trained on 200 points. Uh, so if you want to use like something very general purpose, like the graph neural networks we've been using, 200 points is potentially not enough. <clears throat> but a good idea is to take a pre-trained model, maybe like the one we <clears throat> will be open sourcing. And then that's been trained on millions of data points. But then when you fine tune it on 200 points, it hopefully still has a lot of the quantum mechanics it learned from the pre-training data and it can fine tune it on the 200 data points you have. So in that case, fine tuning is usually a better idea for small data sets than training from scratch. Um, do you want to answer this one? Or yeah. Oh, sure. I mean, so there's a question on like, uh, oh, scrolling around. Uh, could you please explain the convex hull? So I guess uh, we're using pretty standard methods to compute the like decomposition energy. Um, but the idea here is that, like, if you uh, like plot the like energies and like how they can like, oh, sorry, the scrolling is a little bit odd. Um, the idea here is like we're just using standard decomposition energy, where basically if you uh, have the energies of two points uh, or of like all of your different, I guess, sorry, hard, a little bit hard to explain. So like a more concrete example is if you had like a binary system um, with like moving from like purely lithium to purely something of another element, uh, you could plot as you vary the ratio of like element lithium and the other element, um, the energies, and then take like the convex hull, I guess is not self-describing the concept, but like the lowest energies on the linear of the, uh, as you migrate through the ratios. And the idea here is that um, at a specific ratio, um, if it is above the convex hull, it can split into two other points on the convex hull and have lower energies. So like it could decompose into those other two ratios if it was not on the convex hull. Um, there was a question on, I don't know where it went, on could you explain the intuition of like zero shot? prediction and like success rates from there? I think we marked that one. Oh, okay. Did we explain zero shot prediction? There was one that said, what's the intuition behind zero shot giving reasonable predictions, something like that. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, I think the idea there is that like, as data sets like increase in size, or at least the way I like to think about it, is that like, as data sets increase in size, uh, the more examples that you can like put into training, the like closer you might be to having something like somewhat similar to the like kind of task that you're trying to predict. So with the example of like zero shot MD prediction, like our data isn't explicitly like molecular dynamics, but there's a lot of like force data from the like trajectories that we have that we've been training on. So there might be like some frame that's like relatively similar or like even more so like the accumulation of a lot of frames of force data and the patterns found in a lot of this force data together might be able to inform the like force data in a molecular dynamic simulation. Um, and then like the zero shot prediction is like because we're measuring something else like implicitly different from like force accuracy, we're measuring actually the like whether or not it'll be a good conductor. Um, the idea there is that like if the force data is good enough for enough frames, then we will get accurate zero shot prediction. I think that's the intuition I like to think about. Um, but if does you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean that matches my intuition, but I can also just like uh, brainstorm more like 
more micro mechanistic explanations. So like it's quite surprising to me that we never train on pure nickel. And it's not like we have like pure nickel with a single defect or something, but we do well on predicting on nickel. Like this quite impressive and surprising to me because that means that this GNM figured out how pure nickel atoms interact by seeing nickel atoms interact in the presence of other elements. Um, so that's quite interesting. But I think the, the nice thing here is our ground truth is always density functional theory via VASP. So like it, it, it's not surprising that it could work. It's just surprising that it works so well. Um, oh, should we answer this one? How much effort was placed into tuning hyperparameters and learning rate schedules? One area where academic efforts are now um, to material science often falls short is um, best practices in hyperparameter tuning due to limited resources. Okay, that, that's a great question, actually. So, you know, I'm going to mention this a little bit that we took um, Materials Project 2018 data. And the error on that, the state of the art for magnet was 28 MeV per atom. And we found that we could reduce it quite a bit. And this was work led by Sam by kind of doing the deep learning best practices. So for example, one thing is in deep learning, we usually have a well-defined learning rate schedule. It could be cosine, it could be linear. And that's usually quite nice. We just have to tune the number of epochs. Um, <clears throat> whereas like I sometimes see in material science, people use like more manual learning rate schedules. And um, we, for example, use the beta switch activation function uh, and gain benefit from it. That was uh, activation function that was found by one of my colleagues here, friends at uh, Google Brain, Rajit. Um, so yeah, there's some like simple things that I think one can learn just by uh, being more familiar with the deep learning literature that gave us quite a bit of benefit. And uh, hopefully we'll get to share those with the community and hopefully they'll be helpful. But we're also happy to like have a conversation about this and try to share more things that we learn from the deep learning side of Google Brain with the material science side. Great. So I think we're, we're, we're hitting time. So I just want to mention that um, further questions can be discussed at materialsproject.org slash seminars. Uh, we have a qu couple of questions, I think, for maybe within the room, and then we'll wrap up. Um, I actually had one question, which is, you know, towards the beginning of the talk, you mentioned this 1% hit rate on finding new materials. You know, so recently there have been models by like Alpha Lee, like REM model that it's, you know, closer to like 30%, I would say. So I guess, have you had a chance to kind of compare against those models? And, you know, what's different about your model? I don't know if you can say, but you know, what's different about your models versus those more recent models that gets you to 80%? Yeah, definitely. So, um, right. So the first step is we tried, um, so Alpha Lee group also has this 9% uh, hit rate with uh, better substitutions. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's definitely plausible that one can improve the hit rate with better substitutions. Uh, it can limit how many proposals and how much diversity you can have. Um, so in that paper, they were able to find 18,000. We tried to use those substitutions and our GNS to find more, but we kind of like reached the dead end pretty quickly. Um, so I think the one person number seems to be what you get if you just like, without much care, just try substitutions and then you can get to 3%, 9% with better and better substitutions, but that might also start limiting your um, final upside in terms of how many you get. Um, with the WREN method, we didn't compare our structural models yet, but we have tried our elemental models, which should be worse, and we were able to match it and do better. I think part of the thing is we, um, we have more data, and WREN method also we could only evaluate to be you know apples to apples on the uh, same data they evaluated on, which was created with these better substitutions and the nine percent hit rate. So uh, we'll definitely include all these comparisons in the paper, but. I think better substitutions are definitely helpful. It would also improve our results. It can limit the diversity and the numbers. Um, and you know, like it, it's, it's possible to basically split the improvements from substitutions, better pre-processing and better GNN. And we hope to include both of these orthogonal improvements uh, in the paper. And then Matt had a question. Great, thanks. You know, uh, first of all, thank you for answering all the questions. I know it's a marathon at the end. Um, I thought it'd be nice to end with kind of a philosophical question. Um, 
so I saw you did the prototype detection, right? And I'm interested in how the difference between how we look at materials as computationalists versus as general material scientists, right? So material scientists, we'll look at a prototype or we'll think about, you know, is it a solid solution or an ordering of a disordered system? We'll think about, um, you know, maybe it's amorphous or slightly amorphous, uh, maybe it has defects, you know, vacancies or interstitials. Whereas on the computational side, it's just a bunch of atoms in a box, right? So um, is it important to, to try and classify what kind of predictions we have? Does it matter if some of them are defected versions of other crystals? Or, or is that not important at the end of the day if it's being predicted as stable? I just wondered if, if you had a perspective on that. That's a great question. Um, so I feel like one thing that the concept of prototypes or concept of um, these, you know, descriptions or structures we use is one of the reasons it's helpful is because it also helps us classify different physical properties. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, when, when you talk to a physicist who's interested in a particular electronic property, they kind of have a picture in their mind that it will be like a vacancy with some um, periodicity or it will be like some co-doping of some um, elements for some magnetic effect. So I feel like on the one hand, it's nice that we have this perfect um, understanding of where atoms are. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it would it's also very useful to have these classifications, as you mentioned. And of course, one of our big goals, but we don't know how to do it yet, is to discover new classes of materials. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately, like, even, even in the last 10 years, the most exciting discoveries have come from not DFT, but tight binding, like the topological mm -hmm. insulator. Mm -hmm. It was a paper in PRL where they were using uh, tight binding instead of DFT. Like, I'm really hoping that we can improve our understanding of how to find new classes of structures with new classes of properties. And for this, we've been looking into the novelty detection literature, the open-endedness. There are some people in RL, in reinforcement learning, in deep learning who looked into this, mm -hmm. but it's very hard to quantify and automate. So then we can't go through a high throughput structure database and then find the ones that are, are quantitatively novel. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's definitely on my mind. I mean, it's definitely one of the things I'd like to do the most, and I just don't know how to do it. If you have any ideas, yeah. Uh, well, we, can, we can talk about it more. Um, I, I guess one code is just, um, sorry, I know we're over time, but um, I was interested, you know, binaries are well explored. You found a ton of binary systems. Uh, when does that level off? You know, are you looking for six, seven component systems or, or you know, at, at what point do we hit a limit? It keeps going surprisingly well. Okay. <laughs> but it's still in progress. I'm, okay. a, I, I'm a little worried about like how to, as, as you said, like experimentalists might think of like solid solutions and high entropy mm -hmm. alloys and oxides. Like I'm a little worried about how to interpret these things when they have more and more elements. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I think we need to get better at and maybe by talking to you, we can get better. Um, the, the five element system only happened because we were at MRS and we were talking to one of the p members of the materials project community. And he was mm -hmm. saying, you know, five element ones are hard to find. That's why we have so few of them but they're so practically useful. Do you have any? And then we just tried it and then we could find a lot. So that's why we stopped at five, not because like, uh, but yeah, we were interested. Like I, I was visiting, I was talking to experimentalists at MRS and they were telling me these 20 element systems. And I don't even know how to think about that, but um, it's interesting, yeah. That was absolutely fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Great, so uh, let's virtually thank our speaker again. Thank you so much for uh, giving the seminar. And uh, as mentioned, there will be further discussion at materialsproject.org slash seminar. So if you didn't get your question answered or want to discuss further, um, feel free to go on there and um, you know, we'll have a community discussion at that site. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you for the next one. Yep, bye-bye. Thank you, Anubha.